Okay, so we're going to be talking about post-capitalism today. Before we do that, a very short introduction. My name is Jamie Dobson. I work for a company called Container Solutions. Container Solutions have got offices in Amsterdam, where the company started, but also in London, Zurich, Copenhagen, and Scotland. And what we're trying to do is sort of automate nearly all the workflow around infrastructure, data centers, and even application delivery. If we succeed in this mission, there'll be less and less people involved in the deployment of applications and the management of data centers. So I don't know what it's like in Germany, but in the Netherlands, where I was living last year with my, my wife and my kids, I'd been there for 16 years. Um, it was summertime, and I was sort of bored, because in the Netherlands, everybody goes on holiday in summer. Is that the same in Germany? Uh, so I was sat there, and I started to think, how can we make money with open source software? And I started to ponder what happens if we keep going with this path to automation. Uh, how are we going to make any money? What's the world going to look like? And it turns out, surprise, surprise, I'm not the first person to have asked these questions. And what I'd accidentally done was stumble upon one of Karl Marx's contradictions of capitalism. And Karl Marx had said, if we keep going with innovation and increases in pr productivity, we will not need any workers. And if there's nobody working, then there's nobody earning wages, and therefore capitalism will collapse. OK, I thought, sounds interesting. So I did what everybody does when they discover something like this. I went onto Amazon, and I started typing things in. Uh, and I discovered, initially, this book called Post-Capitalism by Paul Mason. He's a journalist, uh, and I read it, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Then I discovered a book called The Zero Marginal Cost Society. Uh, and finally, I came across this book, Inventing the Future, by Alex and Nick. Um, and I read these books, and I was sort of just working through my notes. I was at a conference, and somebody got sick. And they said, hey, can you speak? And I said, well, I can't speak because I've got nothing prepared. I've just got this paper and a whiteboard pen. And they said, speak anyway. So I spoke at GoTo Copenhagen about this stuff, got a good reaction from the audience, ended up speaking about it at OSCON in Texas a few weeks ago. I was really scared about that. Because you know, in, te in Texas, you're allowed to carry concealed weapons. And when people hear post-capitalism, they hear socialist scumbag. And I'm like, I'm fucking dead. Uh, <laughs> anyway, I survived, I survived Texas, and I survived OSCON, and I bumped into a load of very, um, one second, very friendly people there that were very supportive. So the, the, the story of this story is the story of these books, and I must give a big thank you to all these authors, and especially Paul, who actually answered my messages on their Twitter and actually helped me form this story. If you're interested in these books, you can, of course, get them. If you really want a German copy of Paul's book, you can buy it now. It's called Postcapitalismus. That's, that is German, right? Yeah, OK, thank you. <laughs> so go ahead, buy those books. They're excellent books. Uh, all these people are on Twitter. Um, you know, good luck with that. So the things I want to talk to about today, I want to talk about three things. So the first thing is transitions, economic and political transitions. Uh, we often, when we're caught in a big system, whether it's an, uh, a political system or a system of work, we think there is no other way of doing things or being organized. And that's because things change slowly, so we don't actually notice them. It can sort of lead to a bit of nihilism, to be honest. Uh, but we all know that capitalism is actually a very new idea. Um, and the other thing I like to tell people is anybody who's my age and older has actually lived through one of the greatest transitions in like the history of economics. And that was the, tr that was the transition from Keynesian economics to the neoliberal model and framework that we cur live, currently live within. The second thing I want to talk about is these contradictions, uh, the, these Marxian contradictions, because they will give us insight into how a system, not just capitalism, but how every system sort of contains the seeds of its own destruction. I'll talk about three of them, and the last one is going to be about the thing I discovered last summer, which is that if we succeed with extreme productivity, there'll be nothing left. There'll be no, no more work for any of us to do. 
The third thing I want to do is try to answer the question, are we there yet? So I was in, the, in a restaurant last night with a bunch of lovely people, and one person said to me, ah, this talk about the end of work. We've been saying this since the 1950s. And I'm like, yeah, but this time, it's different. <laughs> So I'd like to try to answer that question. And obviously, at the end, I'll take questions and comments from people because I'm also really interested in seeking your, seeking your input. So our story begins, the story of transitions begins like many stories in the Swiss Alps in the 1940s. A man called Hayek gathered together with a number of other um, economists, and they started what became the Mont Pelerin Society. They were a bunch of academics, and what they thought was that they needed an alternative to Keynesianism. So Keynes was all about regulating the market. It's a very simple idea. When you have high economic growth, you should tax more. You take the tax revenues and you put it in a war chest, and then during a recession, you spend the money. So Keynes believed in markets, but he believed in regulated markets. The neoliberals of the time believed in unregulated markets. They said, if we leave the markets to themselves, they will self-correct and we'll have a more efficient and prosperous economic situation. Unfortunately, Hayek and his colleagues didn't get very far because Keynesian... Is, it's actually a difficult word, that. Keynesian economics was so successful that it didn't seem to be... Uh, there was no need for it to be replaced. The second wave of neoliberals, led by Friedman in the 1950s and 60s, worked very hard to build think tanks, take uh, positions in universities, and yet they still gained no traction. But Friedman made a very interesting observation in uh, 1962, and he said change will only come about with a crisis or a perceived crisis. And the job of the radicals is not to force the crisis, but to be ready with ideas so when the crisis hits, you can take your ideas and make them mainstream. The crisis did hit in the 1970s when we had something we'd never seen before, high inflation and low growth, which is also known as stagnation. Nowadays, we call this stagflation, but back in the 70s, they couldn't name it and they didn't know what it was. And so for the first time, Keynesianism started to wobble. The neoliberals were on hand with an alternative. Friedman went from being in the fringes in the 60s to uh, advising Margaret Thatcher in the United Kingdom, Ronald Reagan in the United States. You've probably all heard of Reaganomics. Is there anybody here older than me? Yeah, yeah, two, gentle, two brave gentlemen here, yeah. Okay, so there's four people older than me. Okay, that's good. Uh, Reaganomics, and so neoliberalism got a true foothold in our economic framework. Now, we think of neoliberalism as being the property of the right of the political spectrum. And yet, after Reagan and George Bush came Clinton, and, and over in the United Kingdom, we got Tony Blair, left-wing politicians, and yet they kept going with the neoliberal framework, unregulated markets, financial and housing, uh, et cetera, et cetera. That's how you know you're in an ideology because everybody's doing it. This belongs neither to the left or to the right. It actually belongs to all of us. Um, all of you were either around when this transition began or you've been living in it as children, teenagers, and now young adults. So transitions can occur, but you don't always see them. So, what are these contradictions then that captured my imagination so much last year? So I'm going to focus on three of them, depending on who you speak to. Uh, there's a guy called Dave Harvey out of England, reckons there's 17 contradictions that will kill capitalism. I don't have time for them today. We'll focus on three. So the first contradiction is that capital tends to get up and leave. So you, you have a really interesting dynamic where uh, for some reason, you find a natural resource, or by chance, there's a, a, a human resource, and around this, we start to build infrastructure. Companies, universities. The better the universities, the better the companies perform. It attracts more people to the area, and so you have a sort of economic gravity. Very famous clusters would be uh, parts of Italy and the silk trade, uh, uh, Detroit, Michigan, for the automobile industry, and of course, our friends over in Silicon Valley. 
what happens is, as this gravity gets stronger and stronger and stronger, we attract more talented engineers or uh, factory manufacturers, and we have to pay them higher wages, so things become increasingly competitive. At the same time, this forces an upward pressure on wages and, of course, forces a downward pressure on profit. The landlords in the areas of these clusters can now ask higher rents, higher sales of houses, and so although there can be millions or sometimes billions of dollars concentrated in an area, it might actually be impossible to make a profit there. Uh, we have seen people leaving San Francisco because it's impossible to run profitable businesses there. So the whole point of capitalism is to create profit. So if you get a situation like that, Capitalism is not necessarily nationalistic, it's not sentimental, it just gets up and goes somewhere else. It will find a location where it can be deployed more effectively at creating profits. These transitions, if you stop for a second, are all around us. Anybody know where this is? Detroit, of course, yeah. I did this in America and everyone's like, Detroit. It's like, yeah, okay, okay, okay. I'm not gonna pick on Detroit too much, Detroit was, of course, a famous cluster for manufacturing of automobiles, and the common story is that capital picked up and it went offshore uh, to parts of Asia. This is the normal narrative. Uh, actually, what happened is at least partially, capital went to Tennessee. It didn't leave the United States, so some of the manufacturing actually stayed within the borders. So the boom in Tennessee came at a cost to Detroit. As I said, capital isn't sentimental. Now, I know that nobody here knows where this is. Do you? Oh, a man is brushing his hair. I thought he was putting his hand up. Uh, this is Hull in East Yorkshire uh, in England. And I know a little bit about Hull because it's where I'm from. This is the Lord Line trailer com uh, trawling company. It was a fishing company. During the 1970s, and please don't laugh, uh, we lost what was known as the Cod War. Not the Cold War, the Cod War. We lost the first Cod War and then we lost the second Cod War. And it was a, a, a dispute over fishing quotas between other members of the uh, European Union and our quotas were cut dramatically. What that meant from a capital perspective was that it, you couldn't wring the same efficiencies out in Hull as you could in these other places. Capitalism didn't care about the 300 year history of fishing in my hometown. No, it just got up and it just left. So I was actually born into a deindustrialized city. Um, this is a, a factory further down St Andrew's Quay. This is on the outer rings of the city centre. So the deindustrialization and the decay spreads from the source to all the auxiliary uh, uh, positions, pubs, restaurants, housing. This pub has been like this for five years. We actually can't even afford to knock these places down. Um, Many people get very excited about creative destruction. Those people usually haven't seen the destruction. Uh, it does change your perspective when you've seen this firsthand. So capital tends to get up and leave. Get, tends to get up and leave. This, is, this creates a sort of geographical inequality. So some people win, some locations win at the cost of others. Tennessee, Detroit, Iceland, East Yorkshire, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It also creates inequality directly. Many people know that capital and inequality go together, but we don't always know how. When you have an object, an item, this clicker, the car you drive, the house you live in, it has a use value. And the use value is what you get from it. If it's a house, it's somewhere to be to sleep in, a place of safety, somewhere you can spend time with your children. A three bedroom house in London will cost you about two million pounds. So we, we know for sure that the use value of that house is not two million pounds. I mean, it's worth something, but it's not worth two million somethings. The two million price tag is actually the, the exchange value. That's what you can get for it on an open market. So we now use houses for safety and for comfort, but also as assets, assets that we speculate with. At the height of a speculative bubble, the first people start to exit and they make big money. The next people exit and they make big money, then the market realizes and everybody dumps their assets. Most people on the downswing lose more than they went in with. So by definition, you create an unequal situation. 
People talk about the golden age of capitalism in the post-war era. Uh, I like to remind them that that golden age of growth and economic success came at the cost of the exclusion to 50% of our population, namely women and minorities. So the golden years after the war were some of the darkest years for human rights in the last century. The 1970s, uh, which was crap for economics, was actually very good if you were feminist because we made great grounds during those years. So even the, even the brightest moments in capital's history are actually marred by systematic inequality. Now, this is where we get to the world that we occupy, the world of technology. I want to read out a short passage from this book. This is from Rifkin, because he explains this dynamic uh, very well. So, we come face to face with the ultimate contradiction at the heart of capitalism. The driving force of the system is greater productivity brought on by increasing thermodynamic efficiencies. If you don't know what that means, don't worry, neither do I. The process is unsparing as competitors race to introduce new, more productive technologies that will lower their costs and the price of their products and services to luring buyers. This race continues to pick up momentum until it approaches the finish line where the optimum efficiency is reached and productivity peaks. That finish line is where the marginal cost of producing each unit is almost zero. When the finish line is crossed, goods and services become nearly free, profits dry up, the exchange of property and market shut down, and the capitalist system dies. So what are marginal costs? Well, if you have, you have fixed costs, it's a very simple formula. The revenue you make minus your costs equals profit. Two types of costs, fixed costs, like the rent of a building like this, they don't change no matter how much or how little you produce. Marginal costs are about the additional costs per unit. So if you create a new car, there's the labor to put it together, the steel and the materials and the energy. So clearly, one way to increase profit is to drive down your marginal costs. Typically, one area of that is to attack labor, either to attack unionized labor or simply to automate it away. Clearly, as marginal costs head towards zero, profits will go up, but nobody is then getting... Yes? Okay, so <laughs> I have a question about uh, the shape of the model, so nobody else will understand that. Can you just hold that question till the end? Yeah, thanks. Um, so, where was I? Uh, where was I? Yeah, yeah before that? Yes, so, the, yes, thank you. The, so, <laughs> so, so as we tend towards zero marginal costs, of course, the wage bill becomes zero, and then who is left to buy uh, these products and services? That's the real issue. So Okay, yeah. The race to marginal costs and crappy products. Oh, oh hold on. Not only have you, have you derailed my talk, you've broken the computer. <laughs> How did you do that? Right? Okay, it's, <laughs> anybody help me? Uh, should I restart it? D did Microsoft not just buy shares in Apple recently? Uh, okay. Uh, uh, oh, oh, oh. There you go. We're back. We're back. Ah, whoo. <laughs> okay. So the question I think that's very interesting to try to answer, uh, apart from that question, uh, is are we there yet? So the first thing I discovered uh, about this marginal cost nonsense was 3D printed. And for a very long time, I rejected 3D printed as some sort of fad. All I'd ever seen was people model their faces and heads and print out really poor versions of it. And I'm like, how much did this thing cost you? It's like a thousand euros. I'm like, what, to print your face? And I know we live in the age of narcissism, but this was getting ridiculous. Uh, so I just kept dismissing 3D printers out of hand. Now, everybody knows at Container Solutions that they're onto a very good idea when I say it's shit, right? So they're like, let's keep going because Jamie hates it. 
Uh, and this is how, you know, that's how we sort of manage our innovation process. 3D printing came to me through a friend, a friend of mine called Anthony, Anthony Smith. He is a keen cyclist, but he's also a physical designer. He builds products that you can actually touch, unlike any of like, us lot. Uh, he went on to England, he met his dad, and his dad's mudguard had broken. You know, this thing, it goes on the bike and it stops you getting mud on your, on your leg. It was just one piece at the front. So they went to the bike store and they said, hey, we need this, this piece for this, um, for this machine for the bike. They said, oh, well, you can't buy it uh, separately you can only buy the whole thing and it's 25 pound. So of course they were miffed, right? They're like, mm, we don't want to pay 25 pound for this little thing. So Anthony goes home, he models it as best he can using his skills as a physical engineer, uh, and then he, then he prints it. But of course it doesn't come out straight away because 3D printers take ages, so he goes to the pub, gets drunk, and then when he returns, it's like half done. He's like, ooh. Okay, so they have to wait till breakfast before they can attach it to the bike. This is, this is a good story because he's disrupted the revenue stream of the people who produce that widget, but he's not disrupted it very much, right? But the next thing he does is upload it to uh, uh, a fanzine of 3D modeling enthusiastic cyclists. And they produce things like this all the time. So there's a whole cottage industry of people printing widgets that's currently disrupting the uh, uh, cycle industry. Okay, right, so what? This is not going to change the world. This is not going to make us all unemployed. Until I found this. A house. A 3D printer that prints houses. And I was like, what the fuck? I'm the, I, was, I thought they were only this big, right? I, I had this weird fantasy. I was half asleep and I had this fantasy that I bought a 3D printer and I went to work and when I came back, there was two of them, right? <laughs> And, and then, when I came back the next day, there was two of them and two small ones. And I said, guys, you've got to stop printing yourself. And so to my amazement, I went from understanding these small machines to discovering that, and then, of course, I found out there's a whole range of 3D printers, all in different sizes, from the very small to the very, very big. This has serious implications for manufacturing. Has anybody heard of the term reshoring? Reshoring? One person. Okay. Two, three. So reshoring, which arguably should be called onshoring, I don't know, um, is the process where uh, the, the, the manufacturers that we know in the West are bringing back their manufacturing capability into Europe, and they're putting the factories closer to where their customers actually are. Of course, this is the ideal situation. Well, why did they move in the first place? Because it was cheaper to do it offshore. But reshoring is driven by laborless factories. Factories in England that don't have anybody working in them. So what comes next for 3D printing is actually localized clusters of medium-sized manufacturers who can build widgets that are probably smaller than a house, but a bit larger than a bike part. So, the face of manufacturing is actually changing right under our noses, right? But of course, it started small. What's this gonna have, what effect is this gonna have on relations with China, where a lot of stuff is built? We don't actually know. This photograph is two years old. This is a little bit more recent. These guys are very secretive about what they're doing because uh, they don't want other people to find their secret source, but they are printing houses in different shapes, different sizes, different configurations all of them with, without any labor involved, and all of them fully automated. Uh, and, the, and, and the world of 3D printing is, if you look into that, you'll see that they're doing some you know, utterly amazing things. Okay, so we are reducing marginal cost to zero by automating things with 3D printers and robots and software, but now we have to go back in time to Yorkshire. We're back in Yorkshire. It's not the 1970s anymore, it's the 12th century. And in the 12th century, we came up with this idea. It's a windmill. And now I know there's a few Dutch people in here. Yeah, you thought you invented it, didn't you? But you didn't, because we did in Yorkshire. <laughs> but, but it must be said that the Dutch took our invention and made it better. That's typical for English people. We invent stuff and, you know, sort of discard it and then somebody takes it further. So the windmill was invented 
in the 12th century. Uh, and at the time, it was a gigantic innovation because the only source of power was water power. Water, streams, rivers are always attached to land. And of course, the wheel would go in, generate power. One of the primary uses of water power back then was thumping, and that was where we pre-processed wool. So you had lots of wool underneath the, uh, the water wheel, and attached to the wheel were two gigantic arms. On the end, it was padded, and as the wheel turned, they would alternate like pistons, and they would pound the wool, thus making it easier to handle and weave and uh, knit with, I guess. Um, that meant the people using the wheel had to pay a rent to the landlord, and so therefore, he literally was the power holder of the village. Windmills was the first sort of example of democratized power. People could stick a windmill on the end of the house, build their own craft products, and then exchange, the, exchange them within the villages and towns, and even across extended supply chains. It was a massive, massive boost to innovation at the time. The windmill went viral after that. Uh, after Yorkshire, in only 150 years, it was in every corner of uh, Europe, and actually started to undermine the then political system, which was, of course, feudalism. There is a modern equivalent. Uh, I always say, does anybody know where this is? But that seems a bit stupid since we're in Germany, and I think you've all seen images like this out the train window. No? You are German, are you? Uh, how much, how much solar power was generated in Germany last year? Anybody want to shout out an answer? You, 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 were, good at, you were good at... Okay, he's not German. Uh, okay, he knows, about, he knows about marginal cost, he doesn't know about green energy. Uh, okay, about 30% of all energy in, in Germany comes from um, uh, renewables. It's gotten to the point now where in Germany they do not build new coal stations because they're economically unviable. So the, the return on investment is being undermined by all the other investments in green energy. So clearly you have a sort of democratized power source, right? Solar, uh, with 3D printing and localized manufacturing, you start to get an image that what we used to have in Yorkshire we might have again right now. Solar panels are a sort of on a hockey stick. You know, they get more and more efficient every year. There's a doubling of efficiency and a halving of costs. Um, and this is real. This is already real. Now, the most common feedback I get about this is, well, they don't work when it's not sunny. And it's never sunny in Germany or England. Right? So my reply to this is, well, have you seen that? Does anybody know what that is? Yes. It is a solar power station, yeah. It's a fucking big one. Uh, it is the Atacama One station in South America, and it's one of many. The, the panels are actually not solar panels, but they're mirrors, and they angle themselves to the central stick in the middle. It looks a bit like a selfie stick, right? I call this the selfie stick model of solar energy. In England, we call selfie sticks the wand of Narcissus, right? There's people walking around the British Museum wiping out priceless pieces of art, right? So the selfie stick model of solar energy. Um, okay, so clearly it produces a lot of energy. It's very sunny in South America. That's not the interesting part of this story. The interesting part of the story is that down the main shaft and under the ground, is a lot of salt and minerals. The salt is superheated during the daytime, and in the evening, when there's no sun, the heat dissipates and continues to drive the turbines. So they've created 24-hour power supply with a limited resource, in this case, the sun. So we're seeing the rise of localized energy, and we're seeing the rise of large-scale distributed energy networks. Energy. This is my prediction. Can I, if you let me come back next year, I'd like to see if it's true. Energy is about to become free. That's my prediction. Here? <laughs> In Germany? <laughs> now you've brought the computer. No, OK. Uh, right, the third example of this, this race to zero marginal costs. Software, this is my favorite. Uh, Mesosphere's DCOS, an amazing piece of kit, was 
will help you manage your whole data center with much less workers than you could even imagine. Terraform from HashiCorp uh, lets you provision machines uh, either locally or in the cloud. This thing in the bottom corner, this is uh, the Elasticsearch framework for Mesos. I know something about it because we built it at Container Solutions. And what we did is we combined uh, uh, Mesos itself with Elasticsearch, and we created a you know, searchable, fault-tolerant, tolerant, uh, distributed data source. It's very hard to kill, uh, and once it's running, uh, it sort of manages itself. The two sides of this story are, first of all, 10 years ago, all the engineers in the world couldn't have built that, right? no matter how long they had. But we did it in a few months. Once it's deployed, it manages a whole range of machines without any human intervention. So you can see we're doing much, much more with much, much less, and the artifacts that we're producing have a much greater impact on the world we live in. We don't sell this, it's open source, you can download it, you can distribute it, um, uh, you can use it. Of course it's open source, so it doesn't come with any warranties, you use that at your own uh, expense. So software is contributing to this process as well. That's a hairdresser on the right and a data scientist on the left. <laughs> what have a data scientist and hairdresser got in common? Anybody? They're both going to survive the age of machines. They're both going to survive the zero marginal cost society because they have jobs that are very difficult to automate. We think about automation affecting only the working classes. It's actually not true. Automation affects jobs that are routine, right? And those can be high-paid jobs or low-paid jobs. Machines are currently outperforming radiologists at checking scans. Last week, I read a great story about a machine that was uh, matching the medical profession in terms of uh, breast cancer diagnosis. But on top of that, the machine discovered another pattern in the scans that actually predicted your chance of survival and that would have an impact on the treatment plan the doctors could give you. The machines were matching the doctors and in some areas outperforming them. A non-routine job like hairdressing or data science is actually a little bit more immune to automation. The common economic thinking here is that the rising tide floats all boats. If you watch the American election, you will hear that. As innovations come online, the people who invent them, they benefit. The capitalists who deploy them benefit. And the laborers benefit from lower working hours uh, and higher wages. And yet, we've seen a growth in inequality recently. So the rising tide metaphor was working for most of the last century. It doesn't work anymore. The, the reason for that is very simple. We've gone from uh, a situation where we could share the bounty of our innovations. So an innovation like just-in-time manufacturing for cars, it spread, General Motors benefited, Ford benefited, and all the labor force benefited. In the world of software and high tech, we have a winner-takes-all model. Facebook and MySpace, there is only one winner. It doesn't matter how good MySpace is relatively, in absolute terms, it's gone. Google is the dominant search engine. This problem is compounded by the fact that only a handful of people work at Facebook. So General Motors, even if they did a winner-takes-all winner model, would still employ thousands of people. So Richmond, where Kodak was, was a center of that community because it employed so many people. Once you start to digitize, you need less people, and the spread of bounty is skewed. So that's one of the problems with the current situation, one of the reasons why it's a little bit untenable. So, in trying to answer this question, are we there yet, it does seem to me like we are at least on the way. We have seen many, many jobless recoveries. There's a recession, we innovate, we use software, we fire people, the economy comes back, but the jobs don't. We've seen a stagnation of wages, we've seen higher unemployment and underemployment. Those are all in the statistics for you to see. The Dutch have seen this coming. So right now in Utrecht, in the Netherlands, um, they're running an experiment to pay everybody a basic income. Uh, universal basic income is what it's called, and what happens here is you get some money every month 
whether you're rich or poor, whether you're in work or not in work. And what they're trying to do with this experiment is to, uh, well, first of all, see if it works. Um, and they're trying to come up with policy and ideas that will actually make sure that when this transition really starts to occur, that they are ready. The other thing about universal basic income is this. One of the reasons that automation hasn't spread as much as it should have done is because it's still often cheaper to employ somebody than it is to you know, buy a robot. Universal basic income gives employees the chance to say, I'm not working here, right? Which forces the owners of capital to actually automate even more. So there's a double-sided thing to this. In a way, it's getting ready for the transition, but it's also accelerating it too. This is St. Ives in Cornwall in the United Kingdom. It's a beautiful place. The people in St. Ives are sick of their village being empty for 50 weeks of the year and then being descended upon by Londoners in the summer period. So if you're born in St. Ives, it's extremely difficult to live there and raise your children there because number one, there's no houses left and number two, the ones that are left are extremely expensive. They've held a referendum to say this, if you don't live in the house, you can own the house. So essentially, they're rejecting uh, exchange values and speculation of the property market there. So all the world's eyes have currently turned to Utrecht in the Netherlands and St. Ives on the south coast of England. Can it really happen? This is a question. Can it really, really happen? Uh, during the last industrial revolution, we used to send children to factories and down the mines, all over, all over England. Um, and at one point, we realized this was morally repugnant. We are taking the, the childhood of kids away and putting them to work because we're trying to turn a profit in a factory. Even the Victorians considered this to be a pretty disgusting situation. So what did they do? They lobbied and they pushed for what became known as the Factory Acts. And the Factory Acts were about getting children out of the factory and into school. Exactly the same resistance we hear today about universal basic income, we heard back then. You will destroy the factory. Once the profits have gone, we can't pay for the church spire. And God knows we need more church spires, right? The same arguments came. We took the children out of the factory and we replaced them with machines. So it precipitated a growth in innovation and ultimately a growth in revenue and profit. There is historical precedent for the times we're currently living in. Okay, that brings me to my, my conclusion and I guess my, my biggest warning to, uh, to everybody. Change is coming whether you want it to come or not. Economic transitions happen all the time. As I said in the beginning, we've lived through a significant one in our lifetimes. This is an image of a picket line in Yorkshire in the 1980s. We know that the situation we were in back in the 70s was untenable. If my mum wanted to put a phone in the upstairs bedroom, she would call British Telecom, they would come to the house in six to eight weeks, six to eight weeks, install the phone, which we wouldn't own because we'd rent it off the corporation, uh, and then they would leave. And then every month we'd get a bill, you know, 50 pence or pound for the rental of the phone. You cannot run a modern, a modern country where labor is so sort of controlled that you can't get anything done. It was untenable, it had to change. And yet, the brutality of the change in England was never matched by the changes that were implemented in Germany and France. So the choices of the politicians in the different locations affected what came next. I love this photograph in a way because you've got the labor force on one side and you've got the representatives of the government, in this case the police, on the other side. And the line down the middle is almost perfect. And that it's a powerful metaphor for the divisions in the United Kingdom at the time. Right down the middle, people within the, within the same families fighting over what we should do next. Um, you hear similar stories now, you hear similar divisions now. Look at the political landscape. Look at what's happening in the United Kingdom and Germany. People are confused because the sands are shifting and we don't know what to do. Fast forward to 1989, to a very 
difficult moment for many people in England, the Hillsborough football disaster, an accident, a gate, uh, two gates were left closed and extra people went into one gate forcing a stampede. Uh, 96 people died that day. Uh, many people remember watching it, but actually what happened is there was a news flash and so the sort of the BBC switched from one piece of television to this. I watched it with my brothers. Um, I, was t I was 12 at the time. And, and the, the sight of uh, sort of these, the, the sort of children on advertising hoardings being sort of scuttled across the, the field is so, was probably burnt into the memory of everybody my age. This incident was bad enough, but it's what came next that really, what, what really makes this stand out as a, as, a, as a really dark moment in our history. Because what came next was an orchestrated uh, cover-up from the South Yorkshire police in cahoots with a media machine Right, that had spent the last 10 years perfecting uh, a sort of campaign against its own people. So you wouldn't think of England ever undergoing a civil war, but those of us who lived in the 80s might have a rather different view. I don't think anybody would like to go back to these times. 25 years later, 25 years later, an inquest finally reveals everything and the the families of the victims can sort of start to begin to put that chapter uh, to bed. Um, I don't think there's anybody in the United Kingdom on the political left or right who ever want to go back to the situation that we were in in the 1980s. So every one of us in technology, that's everybody in this room, including me, is complicit in bringing uh, a workerless world into fruition. We're responsible, responsible for creating this reality. That means we're duty bound to confront this head on. And the way to do that is with discussion, with dialogue, and with small decisions. Decisions that will compound to create a society that we actually want to live in. These decisions are not for politicians to take tomorrow. These are decisions that we have to take today. Thank you. There are microphones for questions. This gentleman here. Thanks for this uh, interesting and very inspiring talk. Uh, from my point of view, you're painting a quite dark future for us. Because uh, when I imagine a world in there um, when nobody but haircutters and data scientists have anything meaningful to do, I don't know if I want to live in a world like that. So um, in what way do you see um, uh, the need of innovation or the driving force of many of us in this room is uh, doing something new, inventing something, uh, as a contradiction to this um, development of marginal costs uh, going down and things like that. Okay, so thank you for the question. It's very interesting that you comment, I paint a dark picture, because the feedback I got last time was, what an optimistic talk. <laughs> <laughs> It's like the only voice in like post-capitalism was optimistic. Um, so I love my job, I love working. It does provide me with a lot of meaning. But I always say that we can have a lot of meaning in our work four or five hours a day instead of eight, nine or 10. Uh, I, I don't really, of course I can't predict the future. My hope is that, I don't think we should stop innovating. I think we waste a lot of energy uh, fighting ourselves, fighting each other. And sort of there are other areas to innovate in. Social care, how we teach our children, you know. Teaching is augmented by technology in the same way that data science is augmented by technology, but it doesn't replace it. So I would like personally to see a sort of shift from like, uh, if you look at the financial system, we innovated remarkably in the last 30 years to avoid paying tax, right? I'd like to see that innovative energy just go to somewhere else. Palliative care, the care of our uh, uh, elderly uh, citizens, and probably the care of our children. 
Uh, and I, people are a bit scared because like, oh, what will I do if I don't work? But just take a month off. In the fourth week, you'll soon learn, right? The afternoon pint, awesome. <laughs> Yes, uh, concerning 3D printing, I think we have observed with 2D printing yeah. that it gave us the po possibility that we all can print high quality papers or we can print like books in very low numbers and they're still possible to exist. But uh, I think the traditional 2D printing with mass uh, printing hasn't really decreased. And then when we think about 3D printing, it allows us to do things in low numbers or let's say locally uh, immediately, like with this bicycle part. But I think the um, large scale production will at any time or for a long time outperform the 3D printing because it can kind of optimize on that. I, I think you're almost right. Sort of. So what he said was that 3D printing is never going to come online because it cannot compete with traditional manufacturing. Is that correct? Uh, it cannot compete with when you have large numbers of the same thing or very similar, where the mass production can uh, profit from its, la its large scale. Yes. Yeah, so, so mass production profits from uh, uh, economies of scale, and 3D, 3D printing can't. Yeah, I think it, it, so mass production is at the very end of its technology life cycle. So uh, technology starts, the very first transistor was a huge piece of sand that would be poisoned and they sort of, they took the mains and they stuck the power in and it started to conduct. Within four decades, we'd optimized the transistor to the iPhone that sits in your pocket. So the danger with your logic here is you're comparing beginning of cycle tech, 3D printing, with end of cycle tech, mass manufacturing. Now, I do agree that in the next 10, 20 years, it won't catch up. But 3D printing will hockey stick as we ring out the optimizations, and mass production will just flatline. So transitions are awful because you, you, you think you see them coming, and then you dismiss them. Um, but let's see. We'll come back next year and maybe just see how far we've gotten. Uh, yes, uh, uh, a remark about that you said there was some uh, British city when they said that you couldn't, they tried to stop uh, London people from buying the houses. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I've seen a similar system in Stockholm where I live, and which we have had there for sort of 60 years or so. Uh, and the result of that is that you have to stand in a queue for 20 years to get an apartment in the central city. Yeah. So I would sort of warn for, for that kind of system. I, I, never, I never gave the example because I think it's perfect or even good. I tried to give the example because people are experimenting with different ways to regulate the housing market. Uh, it's a bit similar in the Netherlands. You have to wait for a very long time to get some social housing. Um, and housing's a difficult one because an Englishman's home is his castle, but I think it's the same for everybody in Europe. Thanks. So I was wondering if you could say a bit more about um, the idea of a basic income. Yeah. Because you were uh, picturing it a bit or suggesting a bit that we are running out of work, but we are only running out of work that is generating profit for capital. And, and you were uh, pointing this out to the last question, there's plenty of work in uh, the interhuman uh, area, I'm especially sure. all kinds of nursing and teaching. Yes. And uh, I think basic income uh, is a good way to work around this uh, contradiction. And especially um, regarding uh, open source software development, um, you can see that wages uh, don't have to be a way of blackmailing people into work, yeah. but the wages are just something that we developers need because we need, you know, gadgets and club yeah. and stuff. Yeah, exactly. So. So I, I read an interesting thing the other week, and it said that since when was the American dream about profit and loss? Because I, you know, I thought it was about freedom and autonomy, right? So when, when, did, uh, when did the capitalist sort of equation dominate, start to dominate everything? So uh, when you measure GDP, you encourage everything to be a trade. So rather than getting your neighbor to walk your dog, if you pay her 10 pounds to do it, that will register on your economic, or economic GDP. So what we've tended to do in the last 30 or 40 years is value everything that generates profit and devalue everything that's to do with emotional work, parenthood, 
uh, looking after people, you know, being a good citizen. And that's either stopped happening or it's been outsourced. So in a way, the, the philosophical heart of universal basic income is to acknowledge as a society, we do value you as a school teacher and we do value you as a parent. Uh, the reason my, my skills are so much in demand is because of this skewed inequality. But like, honestly, does the CEO of a software company really generate more value than the children, the teachers who teach my kids? Hard to say, hard to say. Uh, Hi. Um, one can draw an analogy uh, between this production and programming. I mean, in terms of marginal cost. So in programming, there is also marginal cost. Like, uh, for example, if you choose more efficient language, you will end your job faster. Um, so where do you think the biggest gains in uh, productivity of programmers will come from uh, going forward? OK, so the, he said there's some marginal costs involved in software when you're creating it. That's the, the labor. And then the second part of your question was, where will the increases in productivity come from? I honestly, so I don't mean to be crass, but ideas are very special. So software is special because it's so sort of knowledge that's captured and easy to transmit. Ideas are very special in the sense that they can have sex. So we saw Elasticsearch when it met Mesos, we created this awesome thing. And for ideas to have sex, you need lots and lots of ideas, and you need a way for them to uh, come together. You need a facilitator to bring them together. The internet is the greatest pimp of ideas in the complete history of humanity, right? So when we talk about like uh, privatizing parts of the internet, it's extremely dangerous because what we're actually saying is we're going to stop ideas being created and meeting each other. Universal basic income is interesting because there'll be more of us uh, working on these ideas. Online courses like the one you have for Scala are also interesting because that's free education whose zero marginal costs are zero, right? Other than the time it takes to learn, follow the course. So I think the greatest gains in productivity will come from more ideas meeting each other. Container solutions are trying to get rid of all the nonsense around infrastructure provisioning because a machine can do it. And we want to do that because we want to sort of create this world where more ideas are flowing. That's probably where the next productivity gains are going to come from. Take the people out of operations, free them from that awful situation. But then immediately we're confronted with the question, this will create a skewed uh, value. And who's that going to go to? That's the political question that comes with your question. So I think like you are missing two trends. One of them is like every developed country is aging. There will be like less people working. Yeah. And you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, everybody will tell me, you know, like in the media that our system will collapse because we couldn't fund that. But right now we have automation, you know, problem solved, like what to worry about it. Yeah. And the second thing, you know, house in London doesn't cost two million because we couldn't create it, but because it's like so over-regulated. There's like, we can create something cheaper. We can build like higher buildings, but yeah. we choose not to. Uh, that's the problem. Not that you know there's like some just rich people. Possibly. They're just exploiting you know fixed market that you know you couldn't create new stuff. Yeah. So you know they trading it and they take advantage of that. So you think it's the regulations in London that that drive the prices? You know, you know like uh, compare housing to Berlin, right? Yeah. Housing in Berlin is like so much cheaper. No, yeah. It's still Europe, you know. It's like bricks, you know. Like it's not that far away, you know. What is the difference? Why is it cheaper here than in London? Because in Berlin it was destroyed, right? So you could create something new, right? right? You know, there's like nothing to protect in Berlin because it was destroyed. Okay, so, so the two, okay. <laughs> so the two parts of the question is, uh, the second part of the question was the regulations are, are affecting house prices in London. And the first part was that I missed a trend of the aging population. Well, I, I haven't actually missed it. I do know that the population's aging, but it's, there's only like, so many things you can address in one talk. The, the three big pressures right now are an aging population, uh, the automation uh, uh, of all this work, and the third problem I can't remember. Um, in London, we don't build houses because people are trying to protect the green space. That's, that's where the conflict comes from. So it's not a heavily regulated market, but people don't necessarily want to build new houses. However, if you own a house in London, economically, what's the smartest thing to do? to make sure you block all new houses. And that's because you're allowed to speculate with the thing you live in. You take that away and you take away that pressure.
I never said I had solutions, by the way. I only came here with problems. <laughs> okay, you talked a lot about uh, democratizing production. So it comes back to people with 3D printers of various sizes and all. And uh, you gave an example of a phone company that decades ago would have to go, come to your house and install the phone. We, whereas now, we, if we want a new phone, we go to the shop and buy a new iPhone and a SIM card, right? Mm -hmm. uh, aren't you forgetting that part where the, if you read the fine print, you actually see that you only are renting the iPhone and renting all the media that you buy and renting all the games from Steam and it's all just for rental and the owners can take it away from you at any time you want, yes. they want? Yes, so he said, have I missed the fine print in all of these new products that say you don't actually own it, but you only rent it? No, I didn't read, I didn't miss the fine print. I didn't actually read it either. I didn't know about it because of people like you. Um, but good luck to Apple getting all your music back. You know, go and fuck yourself. Bruce Willis was like, I'm gonna leave my music to my kids when I die, and Apple are like, well, actually, it's our music. And he's like, whatever. I think he, I think he put it all on a flash disk and gave it to them. So what's necessarily in our current legal framework doesn't dictate what's gonna be in the next legal framework. And I think there's enough people sort of dissatisfied that uh, there could be a shift there. Maybe. I think that's all the questions, so I'll just say thank you ever so much once again and enjoy.